Good morning and welcome to our final plenary lecture of the 2022 Raptor Research Annual Meeting. This morning's lecture will be given by Dr. Robert Fletcher, and his talk will be Saving Snail Kites in an Increasingly Novel World. Dr. Robert Fletcher is a professor in the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida. His research focuses on landscape ecology, population biology, ornithology, and conservation. He's published over 120 scientific articles and is the lead author of Spatial Ecology and Conservation Modeling, published in 2018. He leads the range-wide monitoring effort for Everglades snail kites, providing key information on population trends and demography, as well as information for management and conservation. Thank you, Rob, for being here, and we'll let you now take over the Zoom session. My name is Rob Fletcher, and I'm a professor at the University of Florida. And for those on Zoom that couldn't hear, one of the things that I wanted to mention was the first conference that I ever went to was a Raptor Research Foundation conference. And so it's just, it's really great to be here today and to talk with you. And I just want to reiterate that this has been a highly collaborative effort over the years and that I'm going to talk about work that's been done um, by many people in this larger collaborative network over the past 25 years or so, all focused on the ecology and trying to recover the snail kite in Florida. Um, and so it's, it's been quite an effort and a real honor to work with so many folks dedicated to this cause. So the, what I wanna talk about today is really, um, uh, context, I, th I think the best way to contextualize this is that the world has been changing at an, an accelerating rate. And in particular, um, a lot of people have emphasized this issue of novelty occurring, that humans are changing the environment, changing it in ways that um, natural, natural native species have never seen. And we often call this ecological novelty. So this could be invasive species or engineered systems, et cetera. And this is something that's happening everywhere, but Florida in particular is, a, is just a real uh, example of all the different ways in which environments are changing. And so for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on three interrelated things. The first is novel species coming into ecosystems. Florida is home to some of the uh, highest densities of non-native species in the world. And these new species are sometimes quite novel and they can really change ecosystems. And then as, as managers and practitioners are trying to address these issues, questions arise in terms of, do we need novel strategies? Do we need to change our baselines for conservation, et cetera? And so all these things feed back on each other. Um, and so I'm going to focus on two general questions. The first is how do native species respond to novel situations? And secondly, how can conservation um, be implemented with all these um, changes that are happening in these novel situations that we're putting species in? Um, how do we deal with this? So I'm going to start with focusing on the problem of novel species. Uh, typically, novel species are invasive species, but, but in particular, they're certain, uh, they aren't all invasive species, or I should say not all invasive species are novel species, but rather, um, sometimes non-native species come into a system and they're very different. They're very different in terms of their traits. And I'm going to focus specifically on the problem of predator-prey interactions. And uh, there's some really good examples of this, um, but most of these examples come from non-native predators coming into ecosystems where they're very novel and they can have huge impacts on native prey communities. What's much less known is the effects of non-native prey on native predators. And this was highlighted in a recent um, in a recent uh, synthesis on this topic, basically saying that our knowledge was almost entirely one-sided in regards to uh, these interactions occurring with non-native species. And so when we think about the problem of non-native species being potentially important as, as prey for native predators, there's a few key ways in which this can happen. The first is that they can be resources. For, for native predators. And when we think about this, it's useful to think about this from the context 
of some key prey trait like body size. And so if we envision a native prey having some sort of distribution of body size, like that shown here, this could be uh, um, something that is a key trait that's relevant for the predator itself. Uh, we want to know how the non-native prey fit in, essentially. And so if a non-native prey has the key trait distribution is very similar to that of the native prey, it's simply going to be a supplementary resource for the predator, and it's really not going to be a novel species. Nothing really different happens other than the fact that there's more prey biomass. If, the, if this non-native prey comes into a system and is very, very different from the native prey, so different that it really is outside of that key trait that's important for predators consuming prey, then it effectively isn't going to be consumed. So in this case, it might be potentially a novel species, but it's not going to alter the predator-prey interaction. Now, this fourth scenario here is probably the one that is most likely to generate novelty. And that is when the, when the non-native prey comes into a system and it overlaps with the native prey's key trait for consumption, but it's on the tail. And when it's on the tail, then there's this potential for this non-native prey to be challenging to eat, or, or perhaps certain predators can't consume the non-native prey, et cetera. Now, this is, this is um, these ideas about potential prey resources have been put out there, but there's also other ways in which non-native prey can be important for native predators. Another way in which they could be important is that they can lure predators into environments that they wouldn't otherwise use. Okay, so we think about this sometimes in the context of urban environments and predators coming into urban environments because there's new prey resources in those urban environments that can be exploited. Now, sometimes this can be beneficial. Sometimes there can be cost to it, depending on the stressors that co-occur in these new environments. The final way in which um, invasive prey have been considered to be potentially important is by generating potentially evolutionary traps. So in this case, the idea is that if that non-native prey is so different um, that formally adaptive behaviors by predators might not be adaptive anymore. And one example of this actually occurring is in Australia where the cane toad invaded Australia and several predators, mostly snakes, tried to consume the cane toad, but the cane toad is toxic to them. And so there were serious costs in that consumption. Um, and so while these ideas have been put out there, we really have very little knowledge about uh, non-native prey and their potential effects on native predators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do four things. I'll try to run through this in a, a relatively quickly, but I'm going to introduce the system we've been working in and some of the key elements of that system that can generate ecological novelty. And then I'm going to talk about how um, predators can respond to novel prey, both ecologically as well as evolutionarily. And then I want to talk about novel prey being potential lures for predators and then end on what this all means for conservation. So, so as, you, as you, I'm sure, know, the key star for this talk is the Everglades snail kite. And hopefully on the field trips tomorrow, you, you guys get to see some of these amazing birds. But the, uh, the Everglades snail kite has been um, of great interest, uh, particularly in Florida, um, for many, many years. It's been on the endangered species list um, since the late 1960s, and it's also um, considered to be a key indicator on the potential success of the Everglades restoration, because it's really one of the few vertebrates that uses the entire greater Everglades ecosystem, but it's largely confined to that ecosystem. So it really tracks the conditions in these wetlands, um, and it's, it's affected uh, quite greatly by changes in wetland conditions, as, as we'll see in this talk. Now, as, as the name implies, snail kites eat snails. And in fact, um, uh, over 99% of their diet comes in the form of apple snails. And because of this, their behavior and their demography, their life history traits, are all thought to be very tightly coupled to um, apple snails, their, their primary prey, um, both in terms of how they move, uh, 
uh, their reproductive strategies, their morphology, et cetera. Now, the, the, as I mentioned, the Florida ecosystem has had huge changes over the past century. So even um, as early as the early 1900s, things were changing. But for today, I'm gonna focus largely on data that's been collected uh, since about the mid 1990s. And there's been lots of great work on snail kites prior to this time, but in the mid 1990s, several agencies and researchers and, uh, came together and, and tried to better standardize the efforts that were going on with snail kites. And so this allows us to look in a very standardized way um, in regards to changes that have occurred in this species over time. And so we try to monitor this bird throughout its breeding range um, each year, and we try to find and monitor all nests um, in this range. And when young um, fledge from the nest, we banned all the young. So over time, we've accumulated a lot of information that helps inform what I'm going to be telling you about today. So early on, um, the snail kite was facing novel conditions. So we know that in the early 1900s, with the drainage of the Everglades for agriculture and for, and for other uses that the thinking was that snail kites declined quite rapidly. So this is a quote coming from Florida Bird Life in 1932, where Howe states, at present, snail kites are restricted to just a few localities that are unaffected by drainage operations. So, so the fact that this system was, was being um, channelized and drained was generating this potential for a very engineered novel environment for this species to try to cope with. We also know that climate has been changing quite a bit in Florida as well. And often in Florida, we think about sea level rise, but even in the past 25 years during this standardized monitoring, climate has changed considerably. So this graph on the left is showing annual trends in both the maximum and minimum temperatures that, uh, that, are, that are measured where snail kites breed in Florida. And overall, the average temperature has been increasing quite a bit, particularly in the past decade or so, where temperatures have increased by about a degree centigrade. Um, and there's also quite a bit of variation in temperature within the year, which is the graph shown on the right. And I'll come back to these issues in terms of new conditions that snail kites are experiencing. But the main real catalyst that I wanna spend most of the time focused on today is the fact that a non-native prey has um, come into this ecosystem and it's spread across much of the breeding range of the snail kite. And this, this non-native prey, the island apple snail, Pomacea maculata is in the same genus as the native apple snail, Pomacea pallidosa. And importantly, it's been labeled as one of the 100 worst invasive species globally because of its effects that it can have on ecosystems and in particular in some types of agriculture. But as you can see based on this picture, a key difference in Pomacea maculata from Pomacea pallidosa is its size. It's a much bigger congener. The graph on the bottom shows a size distributions of snails that snail kites forage on. And you can see that the non-native species is much larger, but again, it overlaps with that distribution of the native snail, setting up the potential for novel interactions. Okay, but, but there's more than just size when we compare these two species. So if we put the life history traits and related characteristics of these two species side by side, what, I, what I'm showing here, what's readily apparent is that the island apple snail essentially does just about everything better than the native uh, Florida apple snail. It's more fecund, it survives better, and in particular, which is, um, it is more drought tolerant, which for wetland species, this is really critical given how we know how variable wetland systems are. And so when you put all these things together and you go out and you sample for apple snails in these systems, the densities of apple snails that we see uh, and that others have seen for Florida apple snails versus island apple snails are incredibly different. 
Um, in general, island apple snails tend to occur in higher densities, and sometimes they can occur at incredibly high density. So for example, if we think about a meter square quadrat, which is a common size of sampling unit for sampling for snails, Florida apple snails often range in, in between uh, essentially none to maybe one or, or two at most snails per square meter. But scientists have done similar kinds of sampling in some of the areas where these non-native snails have invaded and have counted up to 150 snails. So there's this huge difference in potential snail biomass. Now, what was readily apparent early on based on work that Phil Darby had done and Chris Cattu and others was that this was a hard, this, this prey was hard to handle by snail kites. Snail kites were trying to forage on them, but they often dropped the snail shells. And so there was real concern about, about whether or not um, this non-native species was kind of luring or sort of this, this potential stimulus for, for snail kites to go after but that they couldn't successfully, successfully forage on them. And so if we take a look at this video here, let me just move this here. Um, this is a video taken, here we go, at Sweetwater Wetlands Park. And this is a young snail kite just caught a, a Pomacea maculata. And the point I wanna make here is, is a couple of things. One is there's a reason why there's not a lot of species that, that specialize on apple snails. They are hard to eat. Um, and this snail kite is going to take about 10 minutes to actually be able to pull out the snail meat and consume this snail. And because it has to do several things. And this is where it's tightly coupled with the morphology of snail kites. So it's got a it's got to open that, that lid on the snail shell, the operculum, and then it has to take its beak and rip the columnar muscle to get the snail detached from that snail shell. Um, and it has to do this all while not dropping the shell. Um, and it can, it can be a real hard thing to do. And so, again, we won't watch this whole video because it takes so long for this bird to get this snail, but, but the point is, is that this is not an easy thing to consume. Okay, so what we know, though, is even though it's challenging, snail kites are consuming them. The picture on the right is showing a snail kite perch, and you can see, hopefully you can see all the snail shells below that perch. And so former student Becky Wilcox did took um, data on snail shells that were collected at foraging perches over time. And this is just showing part of these data. And what you can see is in the northern portion of the snail kite range where the non-native snail first invaded, in some years, over 90% of the diet was these, were these non-native snails. And so this was really disconcerting because we, we had the situation where we knew that these snails were hard to consume, but they were consuming them we also knew that around this time, the snail kite had suffered a, a very large decline. So this is showing population size and the invasion first occurred in one wetland uh, in the northern portion of the snail kite range in late 2004. And right before that time, population had declined by about 50%. Okay, right after that invasion, when people were just starting to realize that kites were having a hard time foraging on this snail, there was another decline. And so this was about the time where I started working on snail kites and, and tensions were high because people were really worried that, that snail kites were declining towards extinction. And on top of all the other stressors that we know are important for this bird, in comes this new non-native species and kites appear to be having a really hard time with it. Okay, so what are the effects? How, how does this play out in terms of ecologically and potentially evolutionarily for snail kites? So the first thing that we wanted to know was, are kites actually preferring these non-native snails? We're seeing that they're, that they're foraging on them a lot, or is their consumption simply due to greater food availability? And so to, to look at this and to look at other related questions, what we did is we took the monitoring data and we looked at it from a before impact control, sorry, before after control impact design. 
And so I'm going to show you some data that comes from what we refer to as these different eras, which reflect the invasion sequence. And so era one is before the invasion. Era two, um, in, two in late 2004, in between the breeding season of 2005 and 2008, the only wetland where these non-native snails were established, where kites were breeding, was in Lake Toho Picaliga in the northern portion of the range on this map shown as T. And then in 2009, the, the snails spread to other wetlands within the Kissimmee River Valley near Lake Toho um, and also into Lake Okeechobee. And so we can look at this change, this invasion front, if you will, um, and compare it to areas that weren't um, invaded to understand, to kind of isolate that invasive snail effect relative to just annual variation that we know is really important for snail kites. So the first thing that we found was that kites were tracking this invasion. So when a, a wetland was invaded, kites showed up and they showed up pretty quickly. And once they showed up, they tended to be more site faithful to that area. That is to say, um, in terms of their breeding between years, they tended to stick around more. And this is most easily seen looking at changes in nesting distributions, which is shown in these pie charts here. And so in era one, about three quarters of the nesting was occurring in the Everglades, Everglades snail kite, that made sense. But by 2005 to 2008, nearly half of the nesting was occurring in Lake Toho at the northern extent of the range, historically thought to simply be a drought refugia for snail kites. And yet almost half of the nesting was occurring in this one wetland. Now, by 2009, about over three quarters of the nesting was occurring in invaded wetlands, and less than a quarter of the nesting was occurring in the Everglades. But this still doesn't tell us about preference. It shows us that kites were tracking these changes, but it doesn't tell us about preference. And so to address this, a former student um, used choice experiments where uh, Becky Wilcox did two different experiments. One is she would go out to where kites, where we knew kites were foraging and where they had favorite foraging perches. And she would set out two trays. One would have a native, snail, uh, native snails, the other would have non-native snails and she'd try to match them for size. And then she did a second experiment where she put out two trays, both of native snails, uh, or excuse me, both of non-native snails, but of very different sizes. So the first one was trying to experiment, was trying to focus on that prey identity. The second one was focused on um, size itself. So this is showing a video of an example where we've got a kite in the middle and we've got two trays in front of that kite. And it comes down, it catches a non-native snail, an exotic snail, and then it goes back. And so this is how Becky did this experiment. She did it many times. And what she found was that kites don't prefer these non-native snails. They're just like, once you control for the size of the snail, they're just as likely to forage on non-native snails as they are native snails. The second thing that she found was that kites have a very strong preference for snail size and they do not prefer those larger size snails, but rather they prefer moderately sized snails. And, and it's important to note here that this moderate size that's preferred is about the size of a large native snail. So these results were, were really important, we thought, because it suggested that despite the fact we're seeing kites track these non-native snails, they're really tracking the fact that there's more snail biomass occurring where these non-native snails are. And it's really an indicator of just how limited they were in terms of native snail biomass. Okay, so given that they're tracking these non-native snails and essentially redistributing themselves across the range in terms of where they're breeding, what are the population consequences? And so Chris Cattu looked at this question and he, and he looked at, he had two different hypotheses. One was the evolutionary trap hypothesis. And this was all based on the fact that we knew that for these young birds, for first year snail kites, once they fledged from the nest, that based on foraging data, that there appeared to be an energetic deficit 
um, in terms of foraging on Pomacea maculata. And so the hypothesis here is that juvenile survival should be lower um, when um, kites are fledging in these wetlands where the invasion has occurred. The alternative hypothesis, what we refer to as the trophic subsidy hypothesis, is that no, the, the fact that maculata invades in these wetlands, that's going to provide more food. And so any sort of demographic rate or relevant to populations that is food limited, we would expect those, those rates to increase. So things like um, the number of young fledged from nests and survival, et cetera. And so he looked at this over this time in a before after control impact way. And what he found were, were a few key results or actually several key results. The first was that juvenile survival initially increased quite a bit with the invasion of non-native snails. And the second thing is he looked across several different kinds of reproductive parameters and many aspects of reproduction improved. And so when you put all of these things together, what he found was that either non-native snails were having no effect on, on parameters like nest survival, which we know is mostly tied to nest predation, or um, and no effect on adult survival, but we know adult survival is generally quite high in, the, in snail kites and doesn't vary that much between years. But for all other uh, parameters, he was seeing positive effects in terms of the number of young fledged, re-nesting by snail kites, the breeding season length was getting longer. Um, so all these things were having positive effects. And when you put them all together, the population growth rate was estimated to be to increase. Um, based on all of these different demographic rates. And so he found really no support for this evolutionary trap hypothesis and much more support for this idea that, that these snails are acting as a food subsidy. And so let's put this in context again with the population trends. So I told you that, that the population had been declining and when the invasion first occurred and it, and it only occurred in one wetland in Lake Toho, the population continued to decline. But once that the non-native snail spread to other wetlands, the population began growing. And since that time, the non-native snail has continued to spread across many of the wetlands that kites breed in, and the population has continued to grow again. Um, so we're going from at the low point in 2009, 2008, where we had about, we were estimating about 700, 750 kites in, in Florida. Now, the most recent estimate is over 3,000 kites. So a very notable increase as this invasion progressed. So how are they doing it? So you, I told you that these non-native snails were hard to forage on. Um, and yet they seem to be doing it and they seem, you know, and they're, and they're reaping demographic benefits um, in terms of reproduction and, and potentially survival of young birds. And so this was the question for us in terms of just scratching our heads, like how is this working? And so um, my students and I talked about this for several, a couple of years, batting around ideas. Maybe they're going after smaller snails. Maybe they figured out different ways to forage on snails that are make it less energetically costly. And one idea that um, I kept suggesting and my students kept laughing me out of the room was maybe their bills are getting bigger. Maybe that's happening as well. Um, and I, you know, and I sort of thought of this because of the work on Darwin's finches that Peter and Rosemary Grant had did uh, for several decades and showed incredibly strong changes in bill size uh, for Darwin's finches based on environmental conditions. Um, but there was, there was a lot of skepticism for good reason. And so in general, the whole idea here is that novel species can be potential drivers of evolutionary change. They, there's some good examples of this because when you get these novel interactions, essentially you're putting pressure, you're challenging species in different ways, and that's putting pressure on on species that are dealing with these novel situations. And so if we go back initially to this graph that I showed about novel interactions, 
With snail kites, we're in this bottom right quadrant. This is a novel interaction. These snails are bigger and it pays to be able to consume them because of how common they are. And we see this very clearly in snail kites. So, so initially, um, you know, this idea seemed pretty far-fetched. None of my students, they're all very critical, which is good. You want, you want students that are critical, um, but, but none of them thought it would happen. So I just asked them very pleased to just essentially throw me a bone and, and, and check this out because we have the data. And so um, basically what we found was that bill length was increasing over time and it was increasing really substantially. Uh, this is just showing a summary of that since 2000, um, between 2003 and 2013. Um, and this is just showing uh, the distribution of bill links in, in snail kites that we were measuring as they were fledging from nests. And so on average over this time, bill length increased by one standard deviation. Oftentimes when people are interested in sort of evolutionary change in wild populations, we focus on standard deviations because that's the variation that, that selection may act on. We can think about this and kind of put it in context. So the, in the United States, the average male height is five foot nine and the standard deviation in, in, in height is four inches. So one standard deviation would be like comparing someone who's five foot nine to six foot one. And we're seeing even examples of greater than two standard deviation changes when we look at these distributions. So that would be like comparing someone who's five foot nine to someone who's six foot five. So these are really big changes. And so the question is, well, what's happening here? Why, you know, how is this, how is this working and how is it working so fast? And so to understand this change, it's useful to think about um, sort of how natural selection can operate to generate evolutionary change. And, and there's lots of ways we can do this, but I think real simply, if we, if you look at the breeder's equation, which has been used in, in animal science for over a century, um, you know, we think about evolutionary change as the product of heritability, so the likelihood that a trait is passed on from parents to offspring, and this selection differ differential, or just how much of a fitness benefit is conferred from that trait. And so we were able to look at this based on pedigree data uh, that we had, and we used what's referred to as the animal model approach that, that folks often use in wild populations to look at effects like climate change and other, other changes that are happening. So we did this and there are some very striking results. The first is, is bill size is heritable in snail kites. Um, and it's really on par with bill size heritability that you see in other birds. So it wasn't too surprising, but that was an important ingredient of trying to understand this change. So the idea here is that if a, if a parent had a large bill, its offspring is more likely to have a large bill. We also found very strong viability selection on bill size. That is to say, I told you that juvenile survival increased, but it wasn't just any young bird that was more likely to survive, but the bigger build snail kites survived better. Okay, and so this is just showing the estimate of directional selection that, that we, that we um, calculated based on bill length. And this is controlling for body mass and, and other related issues. So this is isolating the effect of bill size. We also know that these bigger billed birds, they were surviving better, but it's because they forage better on non-native snails. So essentially larger billed birds had reduced handling times for Pomacea maculata. And that was presumably um, conferring uh, greater survival. The last thing that we found was that sexual selection for bill size was also operating. So this is showing some work that Ellen Robertson did um, where she was tracking the mating network of snail kites, who was mating with whom over this time period. And she was able <clears throat> to estimate that females prefer big billed males. Okay, and this is above and beyond, this is isolating this effect in terms of the local neighborhood that, that females have to choose from in terms of different males. And there's a very strong selection on bigger build birds. So when we think about evolutionary change, we're seeing that bill size is heritable, 
We're seeing strong selection, both viability selection as well as sexual selection on bill size. And we're seeing that bill size is changing very rapidly for this bird. But even though we're seeing all these parts, bill size was still changing even more rapidly than what these three things could predict. And so there appears to have been a large component of phenotypic plasticity in the change we are seeing as well. Okay, so I just want to, uh, so that's sort of like the direct effects of these non-native snails on snail kites in terms of ecology and evolution. But I want to switch gears a bit and, and talk briefly about some of the more applied elements. So, and the first thing is that these non-native snails um, tend to be more generalist species. And so we're seeing snail kites um, using both foraging in and breeding in areas that they've never bred in in the past that we're aware of. And we call these sort of novel habitats. So this is some, uh, a picture of some work that Kyle Pius did a few years back. And, and one of the things we know now is that kites are breeding in flooded pastures. They're breeding in canals, other human-made habitats. This is an area that Kyle discovered based on some telemetry work he was doing where kites were moving off of a traditional wetland and breeding in a flooded pasture. But that pasture was not being managed as a wetland habitat. And so what happened in this case was the water dried up very quickly and the nests failed. Um, so, they're, so they're using different habitats. We also see that kites are initiating nests across a broader range of hydrology conditions. And this is particularly important, and I'll come back to this, because all of these wetlands are heavily managed for hydrology. And we're seeing in these invaded systems um, that, they're, that they're nesting in much drier conditions than they have previously, as well as wetter conditions. And the question is, does that matter? How does that impact uh, management of these systems? And I'll come back to that. We know that these novel environments have potential benefits, but we also know that they have create new challenges as well. So one possible benefit that we typically see um, is that if water conditions stay good in these novel habitats, um, oftentimes they have, uh, they're lacking in key predators. So this is some work done by Alfredo Gonzalez. He was putting cameras on nesting on, on, at kite nests. And in newly created wetlands, so these wetlands that they're coming into that maybe um, were not um, there in the past, he was, he was seeing very high nest success rates and it was driven by a lack of key predators. Um, but we also know that there's challenges. So one, one key challenge is exemplified by this site here called Marier Mitigation Bank is that, excuse me, is that um, they, these sites can be pretty ephemeral. So this is just showing um, at, at Marier Mitigation Bank, this was a pasture that was flooded and the next year, snail kites came in and nested at incredibly high numbers. And the nest success was really high. It was about 75%. And this was, and this was a real boom for the population in that, in that year. But they nested there in high numbers for about two years. And then they slowly abandoned that site. And we've seen this time and time again. Um, the final thing is that some of these sites are not managed for hydrology and they can be very flashy. That is to say, kites might come in because it looks good and there's non-native snails and they start breeding there and then it dries up very rapidly. And this is just one example of that. So while there's potential benefits, these are, there's new challenges in these novel environments. The two last things I want to talk about in terms of luring kites into new environments. One is that kites have also expanded their breeding range. So there's been some really good work by Caroline Poley, um, where she has basically been sort of com uh, collating evidence over time about the breeding range of snail kites. And this is just showing maps here of the changes over the past over the past 100, 150 years. And recently, kites moved north and started breeding in Payne's Prairie in Alachua County. 
and they've bred in high numbers there on and off uh, since 2018. Prior to that time, they, the last known record of them breeding in Alachua County was in the 1920s, and it was just one record. And so this has been beneficial for kites in many ways, um, but it also uh, it has challenges. So Caroline was putting uh, GPS GSM transmitters on snail kites, on fledglings, and this is just showing some of the tracks of the kites that she was tracking. And there's a couple of things you can get. There's a lot of that you can take from this work, but the main thing I wanna illustrate with this map is you can see that some of these fledglings are, are, are exploring even further north. So one bird went all the way up into central Georgia and came back. Another bird went up into South Carolina. And, they're, and they're, every time we've seen birds head north, there's, there's really no, almost no good habitat north of Payne's Ferry. And they've either suffered mortality or they come back and we, and we lose track of them. And so there's the potential challenges in this range expansion um, and the potential for long-term survival. The last thing I wanna mention in terms of luring birds into new situations is that the breeding phenology of snail kites has changed considerably over time as well. So this graph on the right is showing breeding activity within the year um, with the, the tails of the distribution highlighted so you can see them a little more easily. And the main, the main point here is that since the invasion occurred, kites are nesting across a much broader period of time. So prior to invasion, most of the nesting occurred between February and early July. Now we're seeing kites regularly nest in September, October, November, even December. And there's been a couple of years where they never stopped nesting, where we had nesting birds year round. And on the whole, this gives uh, the potential to have much greater reproductive output, and that can be beneficial for the population. But there's also costs. And one cost is they're now much more, because they're breeding later, because food is more available later in the season, um, they're more exposed to hurricane conditions. So uh, in, in, when Hurricane Irma came through Florida uh, several years ago, it came through in September, and there was 44 nests that were active at Lake Okeechobee, um, and a, a little over 50 across the range, and every nest failed. And in fact, if we look at this more generally, before the invasion, over 99%, or excuse me, over 95% of the nesting activity that we had been monitoring was prior to the start of the hurricane season. So the kites were nesting early enough in the year that they were um, done, essentially done breeding before the hurricane season really kicked on. Whereas more recently, about 25% or so of all nesting we've been monitoring is actually happening during the hurricane season. And this can have effects in terms of exposure to hurricanes, but it also means that kites are breeding in potentially different climates than they would be doing otherwise. And so we know, for example, that as, as the year progresses within a given year, um, nest survival tends to decline. So this is a graph showing prior to invasion, uh, daily nest survival rates that we've calculated. And in general, as the year progresses, um, daily nest survival declines. On the bottom, I'm showing minimum temperatures at um, during the nesting period for these nests. And you can see over, over this period of time, nesting uh, tends to, uh, minimum temperature tends to increase. But with the invasion, what we're seeing is that these late nests, they, they have really poor survival once it gets very late in the year. And the best explanation that we found for this is, that, is they're experiencing much lower temperatures that are presumably causing failure. And so when we put all these things together, we can see that, that the non-native snails are, in, are having direct impacts on snail kites in terms of their biology, but they're also luring them into novel situations where before that invasion, they typically were not experiencing. And so what this means and what I wanna end on is, well, how does this affect conservation? How do we deal with this problem? And I think it's useful to, to sort of address this problem from, from a few different directions. And the reason for that is that this is a really um, 
kind of wicked problem in the sense that we have a non-native species that is that has essentially had benefits for an uh, for an endangered one. And this quote, I think, is, is useful in terms of contextualizing this. So Seastet wrote in the context of novel ecosystems and conservation that in managing novel ecosystems, the point is not to think outside the box, but to recognize that the box itself has moved. And in the 21st century, it will continue to move more and more rapidly. And so with this in mind, it leads to several questions. And so, you know, the first question is, well, given that we have these novel ecosystems and given that we see these patterns with non-native snails, what should our goals be? What are our goals? And what kinds of tools should we be using for management? And have they changed? Do we need novel tools? Have, have, the, have the benchmarks changed for what we should be doing, et cetera? And also, are there actually new opportunities for conservation and recovery for this species? In terms of the goals, this is, you know, this is an issue that's come up quite a bit with managers. And, and, and this overarching question of whether or not we should be managing for increasing non-native snails to help promote the recovery of snail kites. Um, and this is a discussion that the working groups have, have talked about in general, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. But I think the simple answer is no, we shouldn't be managing to promote these non-native snails. But I think we need to acknowledge and kind of leverage a couple of things. First, the, the fact that we have this non-native snail invasion happening we can leverage that in the sense that it's going to be hard to fully remove non-native snails from the system. And, and from what we know, the non-native snails provide a bit more flexibility for management. I'll come back to that in a second. And secondly, it also gives us insight about how food limited snail kites have been. And if we can get native snails right, in terms of managing for native snails while also leveraging um, where non-native snails currently are, we might uh, be able to help recover this species. So we've looked at all sorts of tools and worked very closely with, with management agencies in this context. Some students have looked at implementing new tools. So for example, Kyle Pius um, looked at putting out artificial perches to help kites kites cope with non-native snails and, and to hopefully increase foraging success. And that had some benefits. More recently, Alfredo Gonzalez has reassessed old tools that, that previously uh, managers had used um, these nest structures to reduce the likelihood of nest collapse. And the question arose, a, are these really helpful? Do they really increase nest success? And B, given that kites are nesting in different situations now, would they be more or less helpful today? And so he was able to address some of those key questions. But hands down, the most common and important lever, if you will, in these systems for management and the potential recovery for snail kites is the fact that all of these systems are heavily managed for water. This is just showing one water regulation schedule that we've evaluated with the South Florida Water Management District, um, where all of these wetlands have these water regulation schedules where they're trying to find envelopes of how they need to manage water throughout the year that will be beneficial for the ecosystem and for other species and other stakeholders. And so we've been able to use the kite data to give managers benchmarks and to ask whether or not non-native snails have changed these benchmarks for water management. So we've done this in a couple of different ways. One is we've identified thresholds. So at what point do water levels get too low or too high in a given system? And we've done this across, we've provided site-specific recommendations across all these different systems. This is just showing two areas, Lake Okeechobee and one of the water conservation areas, uh, 3A, where we can identify at what point things get too wet or too dry. And for nest survival, um, these benchmarks don't really change much with the non-native snail because it's largely predation driven. For nest initiation, they do, and we can adjust our expectations 
uh, to deliver that information to managers. The other thing that we've done is we've helped managers and, and the agencies develop performance indicators that are very time specific. So this is just showing a heat map of nest initiation rates at Lake Okeechobee um, based on a, a measure of water depth that, that managers use these uh, based on water gauges in the wetland. And where it lights up, that's where we're seeing the most, the greatest nest initiation rate. So we're able to provide targets and, and, and basically provide a kite based envelope for what would be the best water management for this system and others. So in this case, working with uh, the agencies, this was the envelope that we recommended. But, this, but the, the hard thing about water management and with snail kites and with other objectives is that we know that water influences nest survival. It influences nest initiation. It influences juvenile survival, et cetera. And the key ways in which these things play out for these different rates can be subtly different. So uh, we're currently prototyping apps that kind of summarize this in a, in a user-friendly way for managers. Josh Cullen has led this work um, where managers can take a hydrograph, so the expectation for water over the year, this is showing one example, and then they can input different information to this app including whether or not the wetlands invaded, what the current estimate of population size is, and then we can make predictions using machine learning about the expectation for the number of nests initiated, how well they survive, and ultimately how many young are produced. And we think this has a lot of potential to sort of put all of these pieces of information together for managers um, that will be uh, hopefully uh, sort of an overarching view on these problems. So the last thing I want to mention here is that I think there's opportunities. The non-native snail has provided opportunities for new conservation and new engagement. So this is showing Payne's Prairie in 2019. And what I want to show you here is those are all snail kites. And everyone that was at that prairie along this trail was watching snail kites. It was a big deal. And there's a lot of potential because kites are now coming into these more novel areas that are often easier to access to really harness public support and interest in this charismatic bird. So I'm just, I'm gonna just end with four key things that I want you to take home. I know I've given you a bunch of information. The first is that non-native and especially non-native species that are novel species can really transform the biology of predators. For snail kites, They've changed just about everything that snail kites do in terms of when they nest, where they nest, their, geo their, their range, et cetera. So they can, they can be incredibly um, influential in terms of predators. But critically, understanding why native predators consume novel prey is essential. So in our case, kites do not prefer non-native snails. And so the fact that we're seeing all these changes, it's not because they prefer them, but it's because they've spread and they're much more common now in many of these areas than are the native snails. In the near term, this non-native snail appears to have abated extinction risk. Now this is just over the near term, but over the past 12 years or so, the population has very consistently increased. And so it's given us a bit of a um, band-aid, if you will, in terms of fully recovering this bird. But the system is changing. They, they are now um, uh, using new areas which pose new challenges as well as benefits, but also new challenges. And there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of just how long the non-native snail will be beneficial and whether or not these benefits we see will continue to be as strong as they have been in the past. So with that, that's all I wanted to say for today, other than um, you know, this, this, these changes that have occurred over time for snail kites have been just really quite remarkable. And there's been a lot of surprises. I feel like every year in this project, we've been surprised. And some of the surprises have been, have been beneficial for kites. Some of them have been costly. Um, but we hope that as we continue to move forward, the work that we're doing will, will continue to push this bird towards recovery 
and, um, and persistence. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, unfortunately, because of our snafus at the beginning, uh, we're not gonna have time for questions. And um, thanks, Rob, that was really fascinating. No, it was a pleasure to be here. And if anyone has questions later, you please just feel free to contact me. 